Shall I just use the, can I use this one? Yay, great. <laughs> Kia ora tātou, ko Heria Te Rangi Ahau, ko Ngāti Parau me Ngātu Whare Toa oku iwi, ko Tākuira Rau, ko Tāwai Te Rangi oku, Pāpā Rau, ko Nene, uh, ko James Ritchie, Toku Whai Aipo, tēnā rā koutou katoa. Hi, <laughs> I'm Heria and I'm Māori. <laughs> And this is my talk about why why matters. Ah, <laughs> oh, this one? Yeah. Aroha mai. Ah, this is my nanny. Tawai Terangi. She is the apple of our eye, the matriarch of our whanau, and this is her in her puha patch in Ascot Park, Porirua. As you can see, she is joyous as all hell in there, but <laughs> if you look further, there's a house in the background. That's our house. That's not our backyard that she's standing in. My grandparents came from Turangi as well as Gisborne and they travelled down to Porirua so that they could start to uh, build Housing New Zealand houses in that area. So they've been in Ascot Park since about the 1970s. And so they knew everybody in the street. <laughs> and when uh, our uh, neighbours started having puha grow, my nanny just took over really and then started gathering it to feed all the tamariki that would turn up at our house. Um, aroha mai. I'm whangai to them. Uh, when I was 11 years old, uh, I was given to them uh, to raise um, for secondary school. And I'm also ma the eldest grandchild. So for Māori, this is completely normal. And um, it's one of the joys of my life that I have been privileged to have this happen to me. In 2017, uh, my nanny died. She died from pneumonia. She had had a cold for two weeks. And as we usually do, we ran around after her, sorted her heating, took her to the doctor. We lived in the same house in Ascot Park for almost 45 years. I'm 41. But on the Monday, when my auntie called me, she said, Hedia, come quick. We're in the ambulance. We've got Nan going to Wellington Hospital. I got there in about 15 minutes, and by then they had already done scans on her chest. The pneumonia had taken over the whole of her left side, half of her right-hand side, and her kidneys had stopped functioning. At that time, the doctors and the nurses started to prepare our whānau for an end-of-life event. Two weeks. That's all it took. Forever my love and care to Wellington Hospital for taking care of my gigantic whānau with kids running up and down the corridor and screaming <laughs> while their parents are crying. <laughs> Thank you for your aroha. After her tangihana, I got really angry. I got angry because I had already created or started to create whare haora. We already had a sensor. But from my point of view, it was too easy. We had a cat bite one and the kids, I couldn't put it in there and it felt like an excuse. And so as we were packing down her house, because our house was a housing New Zealand home, I just slept in her room with a thermometer and I measured her room during sleep. So from about 10pm to about 6am I took measurements with my thermometer and it told me that her room was measuring at between 9 and 13 degrees. World Health Organisation recommendations for Komatua is 21 degrees. And as you can in this day and age of the internet, you can look up the temperature of the, ex the external temperature of a suburb via Google. So I did it for those two weeks. And I figured out that external temperatures were ranging from between 8 and 13 degrees. And I compared that with the temperatures that I had internally, 
found the external temperatures as well and figured out that the house was only really adding about three degrees in the middle of winter. And so I count my nanny as one of the 1,600 each year that die from respiratory illness. And sadly, in the last two months, I've lost another nanny and an uncle to pneumonia as well. Pneumonia seems to be the last, last disease that completely wipes you out. And a lot of people tell me it is their time and I say, Carl, we are a developed nation. We take care of our people and yet in this one thing and a few other things, we don't. Dr. Philippa Heldon Chapman, she's been researching the effects of housing quality on respiratory illness for at least 15 years. The research was commissioned by our government, and there's actually a project that she ran in South Auckland or Northland, where they just insulated houses. The whānau didn't have to pay, they just insulated them, and then they measured the health effects of those whānau. And across the board, Chest infections lowered, asthma attacks lowered, pneumonia lowered. And yet, that project was cut by our previous government and it was never started again. We all know this. <laughs> all of us data nerds, data wranglers. If you don't know a thing, measure it and figure it out. And so, myself, Amber Craig, and Brenda Wallace created Whare Hauora. Whare Hauora is a charity. We are for the people. But it is essentially created by a bunch of nerdy ladies. And so, when we were creating this thing, we were very blindsided by the technology. It's very easy to do so and forget about the people. But we soon learnt really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> that you're not about the technology at all. And so our tagline is, an Aotearoa where your home does not make you sick. This is our first sensor. <laughs> Made from parts from AliExpress, it cost us 30 bucks. It also cost me a couple of my fingers because I'm really bad at soldering. This is the one that we call the fire hazard, and Brenda dislikes it when I call it so. It is beautiful. It is beautiful. <laughs> but this is what we did. Bung it together, on the kitchen table or in the garage. We had to prove the thing first. Um, so Brenda has a lot of experience in hardware. Uh, ex wetter about to be, I think, Pixel. Um, and so the build-out of the dashboard was simple because all we had to do was take the data and push it somewhere so that it's understandable, because that's the thing about data. Large rooms of numbers don't mean anything, actually. But this was our first crack, and we honestly thought that we would just do DIY kits for co-clubs so that we could go into schools and teach kids how to make sensors, and then they can, they can be the administrator, they can be the boss, they can teach their families, and they can keep it up and running. And so we went to the Kahau Fund, which is MB and TPK, and we said, hey, can you give us 80 grand so we can package this up so we don't burn little children? <laughs> and they went, no. We're going to ask you to double it out because we think that you should go into manufacturing because we think that everybody should have one of these. And so we did. Um, my job was to take that initial sensor, our initial designs, which were all open source and that were all created from people in audiences while giving talks. They would literally um, design our 3D cases, uh, minima uh, miniaturize our boards, update our code while we were talking because that's the power of open source. We have since moved away from that, but I'll tell you why soon. Um, and so these ones were built, built in Auckland, half manufactured, half by hand. And we built, I think it was 40 kits. And they cost $580. And for a prototype, that's not too bad, to be honest. But if you're trying to cover 1.5 million houses, eh, nope. Also, speed, scale, 
how are we going to get these out? And so we did a pledge me and we sold 206 of these kits. Would you believe that only 60 of those were for actual families, the rest of them were donations to families that are most vulnerable? And so we took a lot of that money and I went to Shenzhen because we realised that in order to go fast, you need to stop doing the things that you're not good at. And so I went to Shenzhen, literally sat in a conference on WeChat and started talking to manufacturers right then and there and just saying, I can be there in an hour. And they're like, yep, sweet. <laughs> and so I was and I did. And the thing, the one thing that I asked of them that I thought was utterly crazy <coughs> was, will you let us put our firmware into your hardware? If this was America, this would never happen. But in China, they were like, sweet as, but not really, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so we came up with this. These are Xiaomi sensors, Xiaomi Akara sensors, with a gateway that holds our firmware. And it's simply because Xiaomi is the largest manufacturer in China. They can do 10,000 kits a month if they want to, and that's only one factory. They have a lot of factories. And let's be honest, I'm not trying to build a safety system that will alert you at the, at the most smallest change. All I'm trying to tell you is if your room is making you sick. And so these sensors, you can buy them right now on AliExpress for about $15, but their app is in Chinese. <coughs> and so we did this and this kit costs $186 plus GST and we can get them out at 10,000 kits per month and we just did our first large pilot to a health facility, well a health organisation called Turanga Health in Gisborne. We're going to roll out 50 kits and it's because Turanga Health do insulation as well as respiratory illness. And so what they want to know is how the home is affecting the family and what changes can be made in order to make sure that family stays healthy. And once they get to that point, remove the kit and put it into another home. This is the way it works. You take each sensor, turn it on, pair it to the um, gateway, give it a name, Aroha's room, the nursery, Katie's room, mum's room, and then it takes a measurement every 10 minutes, pushes that data to the gateway, pushes it to the cloud, and it's displayable on any device, because we do PWAs, progressive web apps, not apps, because if we are targeting vulnerable whanau, they sometimes don't have the data to be able to download that app, therefore make it easily accessible via a PWA. This is some of the data we collected during our proof of concept last year. We did a rollout to Strathmore as well as Porirua, I think about 20 kits in total, and that was just to test whether or not this actually worked. So at the top is a Strathmore home. Um, you can see the data coming through is not that great. And at the bottom is, well, it's my house, and you can tell by the nerdy names that I've given the rooms. Um, I was in the hangar one night putting kits together. I had the dryer going and I had the windows open. That's my garage. This is the same night. There is a location difference. I'm in Porirua, they're in Strathmore. But I'm literally got the dryer going with a window open in a garage. This is what you would see if you had your dashboard up and running on a laptop. Um, say you put baby to bed in the nursery at 8.30. Everything's honky-dory, uh, 21 degrees, sweet as. Um, at about 8.30, or 10.30, everyone goes to bed, turns off the heating. It drops below 21 degrees. And so, you get a notification on your phone. Sorry, I couldn't actually take a screenshot of the notifications, it's quite hard. <laughs> um, but effectively, uh, we say, uh, 
the nursery is below 21 degrees, uh, please add heat or move baby to the next warmest room and you'll be able to see the next warmest room, right? Um, we also let people understand what those temperatures mean to their health because really a jumble of numbers doesn't mean anything. Turn it into something. The thing about temperature and humidity is that below 16 degrees, above 60% humidity equals mould. It also probably me means that you have dust mite population increase occurring. Um, and so what that means is that in that room, you might have a sudden bout of coughing or sneezing and you're not sick. It might mean that you have um, a bleedy nose for no apparent reason. You'll start to get itchy. These are all symptoms of allergies, asthma, eczema. And so all we do is tell people what might be happening. And in later versions, we'll be able to give out full reports on what, how the temperature and humidity in those rooms are affecting your respiratory health as well as your mental health. Did you know that anxiety and depression are issues that come along when you are in a cold, damp room for long periods of time? South-facing rooms are usually given to teenage boys because even though they might be the coldest, it's privacy and they will take the cold with the privacy. Whoops, whoops, I'm going backwards, sorry. <clears throat> it also means that if we are taking data from a whanau uh, and we can give them reports on how their home is affecting them, it also means that at an aggregate level we can also do some crazy things. When I figured out that we could do this, I literally cried and had to go down to the beach. And it's just because, well, our technology is simple. What we're doing is simple. And it really pisses me off that I have to do it. Because effectively, if we know that Housing New Zealand houses, say, because they're all built to a type and they're all in the same suburb location, it means that they all perform the same way. So that means if my nanny's house plus her neighbour's houses only really add about three degrees of heat in the winter, that means that all the other houses like that do too. That also means that if you know how many of those homes are in however many suburbs, that you can give a probability of how much, how big a wave of respiratory illness is coming because it takes seven to 12 days for it to occur. We know the temperature that has occurred, we know the temperature that is coming, therefore we can give a probability of the respiratory illness wave that is coming too. It's ridiculous. I'm literally just a nerd. <laughs> it also means that if uh, Auckland DHB, Kapiti Coast at DHB asked us for a list of suburbs prioritised based on probability of respiratory illness, we'd be able to give it to them. We'd be able to give it to them based on whether or not elderly are present, children are present, what ethnicity they are, what housing type they are, whether they're renting. Why is it that us, with just the money that we earn <laughs> from our contracts, <laughs> and from our permanent roles. Why is it us that is doing this? <sighs> when we started, we honestly thought, sensors, cool, IoT, cool, data, cool. Then we went out to Strathmore and they went, no. <laughs> and it's because the first question that they asked us when we went there to talk to them to see whether or not they would have our sensors in their homes, their first question was, are you from the government? because the people we were talking to are vulnerable families. They are already Housing New Zealand clients, they are already working income clients, they are already on the bottom level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So all they're doing is protecting what little they have when they ask that question. And so it took us a while, lots of cup of teas, and so we realised that even though it only took us about six months to switch from the first version right through to the version that comes from Shenzhen, it actually took us a year in order to understand that trust must be our business model. 
And so we came up with the pātiki. Pātiki means flounder. <laughs> but it also, for us, it means a window into a way an organisation is run in order for the people to know whether or not they should trust you. And so we started with kaitiakitanga. If our whānau is in the middle and they are who we are for, then kaitiakitanga, we must take care of them. In all of our decisions, we must go back and ask, is this in the best interest of the whānau or is this in the best interest of us? And so that means that the whānau owns all of the data that is collected. We are just holding it in trust for them. All we do is provide the service that allows them to understand the impacts of their decision making. Te rangatanga. That means the interweaving, the interweaving of people into the community, the community services. Because way back in the day, when we, when we were still pre-colonisation, we, we weren't alone. There wasn't just two of us with the kids. It was a hapu, it was a iwi, our whānau, our whānui. It's called nui for a reason. It's so that there are many shoulders to hold this work, this stress. And so te rangatanga is interweaving the whānau back into community organisations that will support and help people, like, a, like our example with Tūranga Health in Gisborne. They will be able to support them with respiratory illness programmes as well as insulation installations because they can't do this alone, right? We cannot put the onus of fixing this problem onto these whānau that are already vulnerable. Tēnō rangatiratanga. This one we must have if we are kaitiaki, tēnō rangatiratanga, meaning to give space and order for a decision to be made. But it also means independence. This is why whare hawara does not take investment. Because if we did, it is very easy for us to be swayed into moving the whānau out of the middle of our pātaki and putting something else in. Facebook is the prime example. In 2009, Mark Zuckerberg gave an interview to the BBC where he stated, the data will be owned by the people. 2019, he's in court. <sighs> and it's because he lacked independence to be able to say no. We're doing these things the hard way. We're doing this mahi the really hard way. But this is the only way that we can assure that we can hold independence for our whānau. Because otherwise, utu would not occur. Utu, payment, money, compensation. It is true that whare water will sell consented, aggregated insights, or maybe even a data set. We haven't come to that yet. Um, and when we do, we will give 50% of the profit back to the families that are within those data sets, simply because Without them, there would be no data. Without them, there would be no way for us to be able to fix any of this. So you must give utu. You must give back. I've done these talks quite a few times. And a lot of them, especially in the last one, there was a collective gasp. <gasps> because I said something like, government agencies should get out of the way give the money and the resources to the people so they can fix the problems that they are facing. The people already know. I've been asked all the time, how do you speak truth to power? The power already knows. The thing is, when you speak lies to the people, the people already know. And so, when we talk about our pātiki, when we talk about it being a window for an organisation to understand whether or not they're trustworthy or not, the people already do this. They do it in the blink. <laughs> Level of trust. The formal message, what the organisation says. Then what they actually say on the front lines. The formal values, you'll find them on the website. And then what the organisation actually does. I could pretty much pick apart government departments left, right and centre right now. 
<laughs> I don't need to do that, right? But the fact of the matter is, the people already know. The way to get around this, the way to increase your level of trust is transparency above all else. Transparency and the f fact of the matter that the formal message and the formal values come from ELT, your executive level, your ministers. What you actually do and what you actually say come from your front line. So, when your ELT and your front line are out of whack, your level of trust is buggered as well. When they come together and they are balanced, then your level of trust increases. Which means that the feedback loops between the two need to be tighter, need to be shorter, because what an ELT says and what the front line does changes in middle management. I've been doing digital transformations <laughs> for a really long time. And so when I wrote this talk, I was like, holy shit. <sighs> it amazed me that we have been doing these things for a really long time, and yet, no one's told anyone to their face that they suck. We point at, we get on social media, we get on our rant, we point at articles, we stop calling kainga order, kainga order, and call it Housing New Zealand. We call SIPs, SIPs, because as a people, this is what we can do to push. But the change that we're starting to see now is that organisations like mine, they are indigenous, they are wahine, and they are simply cutting them out. Because that is the only way that we know that we can get things done with the values of our whānau and our organisations intact. And it's ridiculous, like I've said multiple times, but you're going to see more and more organisations like mine do this, because we, have, we are already seeing the fruits of a really poisonous labour, our homeless, our children, our kaumatua, and it can't happen anymore. And so, when you go back to your organisations, apply the pātaki to them. Chances are, though, you already know. Because you already know who you serve. And when things go awry, or a message is reinterpreted as something other than who you serve, you get a pang in your heart. And you don't want to do the thing, but you have bills to pay. And we all understand that. But try just a little to influence, influence as a group to say, hey, this is not what you're saying here. Why aren't we for the people like we say we are? Because, in the end, it all comes back to this. This is my nanny. With her last grandchild, before she died. And if everyone ever wonders why I still keep doing the thing, this is why. For your grandmothers, for your grandfathers, for your grandchildren. Because this world is a bit buggered. <laughs> and I refuse to leave it like this. Nō reira, tēnā rā koutou, tēnā rā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa.
Have we got the bouncy boxes? Does anyone have any questions? Go ahead, Ian. No? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I know, I had to do a bit of a swallow so I don't squeak, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a question over, somewhere over here. The bouncy box is coming. Yeah. <laughs> ah, good catch. Oh, this is exciting. Uh, how did you fund yourselves to get started, I guess you had to give up paid work and that kind of thing, so how did you get it going? Yeah, so <laughs> it's a bit of a funny thing. So at the beginning, we did it part time, and so we just put money in, and then we, we made the decision that we would go contracting, because we're all tech people, um, and put money into the bank account in order to pay for the things. Um, but then we also, I started pitching. So I pitched to the company that I was working for, and I said, look, I'm working on this thing. We think, we think we can help, we can help our people. I'd like to go down to part-time. And they were like, yeah, sweet as. <laughs> so I guess the way to start is to ask. Thank you. More questions? Yeah, over here. Oh, right up the front. Big throw. Heads up. Um, I'm, I'm interested in um, the children that you um, got involved with creating the boxes. Um, what are they saying about potential solutions to the challenge? Yeah, so um, when we created the DIY kits, um, the kids loved it, but our first, when we did our first rollout, that first one that looked like that, um, that was DIY. So when we went into Strathmore, uh, a lot of the program was to teach them how to put their kits together, and a lot of that came from questions from them going, does it, does it have a microphone in it? Does it have a camera in it? Is it a bomb? Right, um, but if you look at the technical understanding of a lot of people in vulnerable families, it's not that deep. Therefore, their questions are valid, right? Um, and so when you pull it apart and you've got three pieces and you can show them where the sensors are and you can show them that if they want to turn it off, all they have to do is pull out the battery, then the understanding of what technology is, because the fear, the fear was really high. Um, am I going to break it? Is it going to give me an electric shock? Um, how do I use a screwdriver? Lefty Lucy, righty tighty. Uh, the thing we had to do, of course, was get rid of soldering. Uh, <laughs> and so all it was, really, was teaching them what everything was, where the batteries go, and screwing it together. And that there is nothing in there that, that can hurt them or that they can break. Um, kia ora, my name's Mark. Um, thank you for your korero. I think I'll go and give my kids a tighter cuddle tonight than what I would have normally. Um, I'm interested in uh, like how government gets out of the way and how, um, especially in relation to the flow of money, right? Yeah. Like the, the, I mean, we had the Minister of Finance here yesterday, yesterday morning. And I'm really interested um, in your experiences or your thoughts of how in terms of the role of, of government for helping connect the purse strings mm. to the agencies and the instruments and communities doing social good and changing the lives of people. So do you have any sort of comments or experiences from your perspective here? Yeah, and this is mostly from the periphery because of course we've never gotten funding, therefore. Um, and so the thing that we have noticed is that uh, when agencies give money, it comes with a whole heap of role, uh, rules and regulations that we have to hit. And the solution generally is already predetermined, uh, and even who will deliver that solution is already predetermined. Mm. Uh, and I'm like, but you all don't know. You literally don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, and so for me, when I say agencies need to get out of the way, it's that they say, or they, in, in concert with the community, figure out what the vision is. Because the who is the community, right? They say, maybe, well, we have a total budget of $300,000. We'll give that to you in six months lease stints. Um, we need you to hit these, this vision at this end and not put gateways in between. That way, they can also supply um, people that know what they're doing, understanding around user experience, et cetera, et cetera, and just give them the resources in order to do the thing rather than already predetermine what that thing will look like and who it will serve. Thank you. Yeah. Over here, big, Hi. another big throw. Do I really? Yeah, someone else will help. We're a community. I really want to go over arm with this, but I won't. <laughs> or maybe I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> nice one. <laughs> Um, hi, um, thank you for your talk. Um, this is the second time I've seen it and um, it's no, no less emotionally charged and significant um, than it was the first time, um, so thank you. Um, I was wondering, you say um, as part of your, is it Pataki? I don't know if Pataki. I'm saying. Pataki. Pataki, sorry. Um, that you, you, you seek the permission of Farnell before you uh, hand over any data. And I was just wondering whether you could elaborate on what those conversations look like, how you choose, how you agree, what you even take to them first. Yeah, so um, everything that we do, because we need to be scalable and fast, is done technically. And so uh, this is the design for the moment. We haven't implemented yet because we don't have the money. Um, but we have an ethics committee. And so when an organisation comes to us and says we want a set of data, we start to figure out whether or not they meet our pātaki, if their values are aligned, and we also have something called hefeke, which also determines the permissions that the farm family should, um, that the organisation should have, depending on how much that data will affect the whānau. Now the example I'm going to give, because I'm always giving Housing New Zealand shit, um, <coughs> So, uh, Housing New Zealand are running a smart homes project where they put sensors into homes and they do temperature, humidity and CO2. Uh, the thing about Housing New Zealand, of course, is that predominantly vulnerable families. Therefore, um, when a whanau goes in there and their uh, mother with two children, she's on the benefit, um, and for, I don't know, a reason, a cousin comes to live with them because it's either that or the car. And so for four months, someone else lives in that house with them. The sensors, because they have CO2 in them, will tell you how many people are in the house at any point in time in any room. Right? And so if we look at the data sharing policies across government departments, this is a mother on a benefit, so her benefit is affected. Um, her tenancy agreement is affected because she has more than the number of people that she has stated. And so the ramifications are long, mm -hmm. far, and so, so our fiki it shows us what data any organisation is allowed to have, and that's why we also don't do CO2. Um, so if the whānau is the head of the fiki, they see all, it's theirs. If they want to, they can download it and remove the sensors, it, it's theirs. If you go out one level, then we're talking about health organisations that already have a relationship with the whānau, like Tūranga Health. So maybe they already know that the whānau has previous respiratory illness, they might be at, at risk of rheumatic fever, they have previous chest infections, and so what they're wanting to do is understand the depth of the change that needs to happen in the house in order to change those health outcomes. And then you have the outer legs of the whiki. That is pretty much open data. And that's the data that is um, aggregated to such a degree that we have a minimum of 50 homes per data set point, um, as well as there are some others that I can't remember. But effectively, oh yeah, not real time. <laughs> it's so that that data cannot affect a family's life. 
And so we'll be posting the whiki soon. And uh, from a technical implementation point of view, effectively we're building a domain name server for data. So someone will do a request, we will tell them if the data is available, we'll do the um, values and ethics checks, uh, and then we'll be able to tell them whether or not they can have said data or not, because we will simply send a notification to the whānau saying, Housing um, New Zealand has asked for this, how many people are in your house? <laughs> the impacts are on a benefit if you're on one, on your tenancy agreement, da 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 da, and they can say yes or no. But yeah, that's essentially. I think you've um, almost answered my question twice, but um, fantastic talk. Does, it, does this go out to private landlords and can that kind of work, in that, that framework as well? Yeah, so uh, we haven't come up with the um, where a private landlord would sit, but we know that we'll be able to say things like, um, a lot of the time you'll see statements like, the family just needs to open the windows. <coughs> but that question is out of context, right? Mm. Uh, it's, does the house have insulation? What is the external temperature? What is the external humidity in comparison to internal? Do you know what I mean? So you can answer the question of, uh, have you opened the windows with a no, but there might be a bloody good reason around it. And so all we need to do is create a, essentially a dashboard where we take the whānau's point of view as sacred and then we give enough information to landlords in order to be able to make decisions around the house. Because the use case that we have to be careful of is that if we start to say, oh, all of the houses in Ascot Park need, uh, need insulation, all the landlords go, OK, everyone move out. We'll do the insulation, we'll do the ventilation, we'll ensure that you have, I don't know, heating throughout all your rooms, and then they'll go, cool, now it's $800 instead of 700 So yeah, we have to be really careful. Last question, we're eating into morning tea, which is, shows how good this talk is. Um, Jay, so yes, last question, Jay. Thank, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, it was incredible, very moving, very thought provoking. Um, how can I follow what you do and, and subscribe to your newsletters? Because uh, I just, I'm really enjoying what you do. Uh, thank you. So, www.farehaora.nz. Um, I really need to update the website, but I'm literally a 1.5 woman band <laughs> with a really good tech team. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I'll update that as soon as possible. And there is a newsletter you can subscribe to. All right, um, I'll wind up now. I'm just going to keep it really short and ask what is our pātiki, what's in the best interest, interest of the people that we serve, and I also want to let you know that um, in honour of Hedia's nanny and Hedia's talk today, we're making a... I would, sorry, I'm crying on stage again. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're going to be making a donation um, in honour of Hedia's nanny, um, and I'll be making a personal donation as well. If you're interested in that too, let me know, and um, I'll sort out the details. Hedia, aroha mai, aroha nui. Thank you so, so much. Um, I think from the number of questions, you can see the impact you've made on this audience. 